Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to um, H.R. Harmer's first live stream. Um, we really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, we're here at our office in New York. I'm Charles Epting, for those who don't know. Uh, I'm Allison Sullivan. I'm Alyssa Baumgartner. And we're here to discuss our upcoming auction um, on January 17th. Uh, in just a couple of weeks now, we've got the eighth part of the Arivon Collection of United and Confederate States Postal History. Catalogs just went in the mail uh, this week, so we figured we would um, just join you all um, and and talk a little bit about what goes in to putting a catalog like this together, um, what it takes to market a sale like this, um, as well as engage in, in a Q&A with you guys. If you have questions at any point, we'll be watching the, uh, the chat. And then we each wanted to pick an item from the sale, our favorite item, not necessarily uh, you know, one one you might expect. So we're we'll be uh, again each discussing our favorite item as well. So um, a little bit of background about the Erevan collection. I'm sure many people know about this collection, but for those who perhaps don't, um, Erevan Haub was a German business uh, magnate who unfortunately passed away in 2018. But before he did, he was able to put together one of the most magnificent collections of United States and Confederate postal history ever, in addition to um, Austria, German states, worldwide rarities, you name it, he probably collected it. But the reason he felt so passionately about American history and American philately is as a young boy, uh, before he inherited his family's fortune, he was sent to Southern California, uh, not far from where our office was located in Orange County, to stock supermarket shelves. His family did not want him to take anything for granted, so he started at the bottom of the food chain. And while in America as a young boy, he developed this love for American history, whether it's the Pony Express or the Civil War. These great iconic moments in American history really captivated him. And I think it's interesting because I think a lot of times it's it takes an outsider to make us appreciate what's right in front of us. I know I don't want to speak for you guys, but um, I don't go to the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty uh, on a regular basis. It takes somebody coming in from out of town to visit the Metropolitan Museum. These are things that, um, uh, you know, again, sometimes it takes an outside perspective to uh, to make us appreciate them. So it, it took this German businessman coming to America uh, to put together really one of the all-time great uh, collections of United States postal history. This collection is so uh, massive and so uh, comprehensive. Um, we are currently entering our fourth year of selling it. It began in June of 2019 with the sale of the Alexandria Blue Boy for $1.18 million. And we're still going strong in early 2023. Uh, uh, this is the eighth sale, like I said. We have at least two more after this, plus specialized sales of Western postal history and fancy cancellation. So we're looking at four or five more sales after this. It uh, it seems like it'll never end, which is uh, the best possible problem for us to have as auctioneers. Uh, but this eighth sale, um, uh, what I love about these catalogs is we didn't just say um, all of the Confederate provisionals will be sold in one catalog and all of the um, you know uh, fancy cancels will be sold in another catalog. Each catalog, each sale, is a cross-section of the entire collection. So there's United States provisionals from the mid-1840s. There's general U.S. postal history going back to the 1847 issue all the way on up through the 20th century. There are fancy cancellations. There's Confederate provisionals. There's Confederate general issues. There's locals and carriers. There's Pony Express. There's a little bit of everything um, in this catalog. It is on our website. There's also a PDF page flip version you can see. So if you're interested in learning more, uh, you, we, we highly encourage you to, um, to go check that out, but, um, yeah, that's, that's just a little bit of background about this remarkable collection. Um, I'm, I'm very honored and, and proud to be able to, um, yeah, handle this material and present it to people. Mr. Haub was collecting over the course of decades. A lot of these things he bought back in the seventies and eighties, and they've been off the market ever since. So, you know, in a lot of cases, it's, it's difficult to describe or price these things because we're the first people to handle them outside of his immediate circle in many, many years. And in some cases, uh, you know, there's, there's very little sale records or, um, uh, you know, information behind these items. So we're, we feel like we're um, uncovering these items. We're, you know, seeing them for the first time in a generation. And that's really exciting. But in addition to putting together the catalog, in addition to, uh, you know, making sure that um, our descriptions are as engaging and interesting as possible, we also have to engage the non-philatelic community. I think it's really easy for us to um, sell really nice stamps to stamp collectors, people who have already bought in. Uh, it's easy to put it in front of them and, and have them get excited. But I really want to make sure that our catalogs go beyond the low-hanging fruit of 
philatelist. So I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa for a couple of minutes to talk about how you even market something like this. Yeah. So when Charles and I first started talking about the eighth installment of the Erivan collection, we really wanted to reach out uh, past the philatelic community. Sometimes uh, marketing for philately can get a little bit stagnant. Uh, it usually looks about the same. We reach out to philatelic magazines, philatelic periodicals. Uh, maybe you send out a postcard, uh, send out a few emails to the people you usually send emails to. Uh, but it usually doesn't stretch out beyond our normal network. And we wanted to change that a little bit. Uh, so so something we started doing was we reached out to the towns that these uh, pieces of postal history originated in. Uh, so Charles has been doing some interviews with um, Hillsborough, North Carolina, Marion, Virginia, uh, Demopolis, Demopolis, Alabama, uh, Washington, Indiana, which are all smaller town newspapers um, that find this really fascinating to get a little piece of their postal past um, up at auction in New York City um, and getting to learn a little bit about something that originated in their town. And that's kind of special because that makes philately relevant to people outside of the hobby, uh, which I think is really cool. And we started also doing more social media uh, during the sale. Charles made a few YouTube videos for this, um, and we made some Instagram videos for this as well to try to reach out to more people um, and get them interested in the hobby. Uh, so yeah. And I think what's really fantastic about this is, look, if if uh, people in uh, Demopolis, Alabama or Goliad, Texas read about this. I'm not expecting all of them to uh, jump into philately or become advanced collectors. We have to be, um, you know, realistic about um, our expectations. But I think, you know, if somebody opens the morning paper and sees an article about stamp collecting that has a personal connection to their community and, uh, you know, like it makes them feel special. It, it shows them that, um, you know, th this is a hobby that's not just a bunch of people, uh, you know, um, in solitude with with a pair of tongs putting stamps in an album this is something that's very uh engaging and it's rooted in history and these one, one thing i've noticed about these these towns that we're talking to these people love their history and i think you know being in new york we get the the post and the times and i think we're a bit jaded but we don't realize that the we don't realize the power that a local newspaper can have you know the, the big publications are the ones that i think are struggling the most the 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 local community oriented publications are the ones that will continue to thrive even even, even as um, you know print journalism has its ups and downs. So it's been very rewarding. And the feedback we get from people, I think, is just really wonderful. The same thing with our with our social media videos. We can reach more people in 24 hours with a video than all of the catalogs we will send out for a sale. And again, the catalogs go to collectors who are going to be bidding in the sale. The video is reaching people who maybe will never buy a stamp in their life. But if only one or two of those people dust off a relative's collection, give it a second look, um, I think that's very rewarding. And it's something that we you know, as industry leaders need to be doing more of. So I'm, I'm thrilled with the work that Alyssa has been doing um, as marketing manager. And I think this is a real step forward, you know, both for Harmer and for the hobby in general. Absolutely. Um, I think it's really special, the response we've gotten as well, because I think people have said to you over and over again, I never thought um, stamp collecting or philately or anything like that was relevant to me at all. Um, but when you put things in terms of, this comes from where I come from. These are the people who founded my town. This is where we started from. Um, it's really special to those people and it, it puts it in perspective and it makes it as important as, uh, as art collecting or, or anything like that. It creates um, a sense of purpose for what philately is and it grounds it. So it's been a really cool experience to be able to connect people to that. Allison, you're up. I'm up. It's my portion. Um, we didn't want to go through the catalog item by item and tell you about all of it because that's why we made a catalog. Um, so we decided that it would be a good idea to share our favorite items or one that we remember coming into the office for one reason or another. So I'm going first. I picked. And again, before Allison, I want to say these again are our favorite items. Yeah, this is this is not. This a is a a purely um, personal choice. 
And yes. um, that's why I think these are so fun. It's because they really run the gamut of what is in the Erebon collection. This is so, not our uh, choice of what is the most rare or valuable. This is just our personal favorites. Mm -hmm. Completely subjective. Um, ooh, I picked lot 90, which is the... See if we can hold it up. The uh, three cent Hillsborough, North Carolina provisional. Um, I picked this lot for a couple of reasons. It comes from North Carolina, just like me. Um, <laughs> but also Charles, it came into the office and we spend the time going through each of them. And it's interesting to see all these pieces and he helps talk us through all of it. And this one really interested me because, well, for a couple of reasons, one of them, the concept of three cent uh, Confederate provisionals was new to me. And I started doing uh, some more reading on it. He sent me some articles uh, that I read and this kind of middle ground that they exist in where it's not exactly a Confederate stamp or a U.S. provisional. And it's in this limbo period, just like a lot of... Um, other elements of society during the Civil War I found really interesting. Um, and from a market perspective, I think it's interesting because this is, she's from the South, so it's her debutante on the auction block. Um, <laughs> and I think it's interesting and exciting when something like this uh, comes up that hasn't been seen at auction and it hasn't had a chance to see the realization that it could get and it, people, people get... Um, to see it for the first time, kind of. So since it was first described in an article by Trish Kaufman in 1984, um, it hasn't been offered at auction. I think that's really exciting, other than the history of it, which is also... So if it hasn't been offered at auction, how did Mr. Howe acquire it? Oh, you wrote that in the description. Um, <laughs> would you like to say it so that I don't try and read and find it? No, this is something that was it was um, it was bought privately. Yeah. So it was bought through a dealer, through a broker, um, so that it it never appeared at auction. So um, I, I, I agree with Allison. It's really exciting. We get to essentially um, yeah, introduce it to the market publicly mm -hmm. and see what it's worth. That's the best part of auction is we um, we just get to put it out there and see what two people are willing to pay for it. Yep, that's so that's my favorite personally. Um, we'll another look. Oh, okay. Right. Um, my favorite. Ooh, I don't know the lot number. I should have looked that. We'll check really quick. Okay. 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 Um, you talk about it. I'll come yeah, to I will talk about it, and Allison will interject. Um, 81. This is lot number eighty-one, and it is the Hockenham Fox. Uh. It's a fancy cancel and a little bit about fancy cancels in July of 1862. Uh, the government started requiring that you had to obliterate a stamp with more than just the regular town date stamp um, so that people couldn't reuse the stamp was the concern. So some of the postmasters started getting a little bit artistic with it um, and started creating um, pictures out of corks um, and, and different things to cancel stamps. Uh, a lot of these fancy cancels come out of Waterbury. Um, we've sold a lot of the Waterbury fancy cancels, including the running chickens, um, our last sale. But this comes out of Hockenham, Connecticut. And uh, it comes from a postmaster named Dudley Fox. And Dudley Fox's family fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, his grandfather uh, actually was on the USS Revenge with uh, Benedict Arnold. So very cool. Um, and he was a silversmith. Uh, so he was used to carving very ornate designs into things. And he was very detail oriented. Um, he became the postmaster in 1865, um, and he was postmaster until 1867. Uh, Hockenham first got a post office in 1850. Uh, and so he started creating this Fox fancy cancel because his last name was Fox. Uh, and this was uh, confirmed by uh, a cousin wrote a letter about it um, that ended up uh, in the hands of a stamp collector. Uh, and she talks about how she remembers that he would carve Fox designs into corks. And he was very meticulous and he was very detail oriented. And so he would car carve a lot of these because every time he saw that the strike wasn't coming through super well because the cork was wearing down, uh, he would carve another one because he wanted people to be able to tell that it was a fox. 
Um, unfortunately, for a while, there were actually people who thought this was um, this was a goat or a wolf, which I don't fully understand because it looks a lot like a fox to me. Um, I can see the wolf. A little I can bit. see the I wolf a little bit. Yeah. I can't see the goat. I'm gonna be honest. Um, but that was erroneous. It it is a fox. Um, there's eleven uh, of these cancels that we know of, um, and they all appear on 1861 three cent and ten cent stamps. Um, and I really love this cancel a lot because um, I think Stephen Sondheim said uh, the two <laughs> things we leave behind in this world um, are children and art. Um, and I think this is a little piece of art that this man left behind to celebrate um, his family that he was very proud of. Um, and I think that's really special and beautiful. So it's lovely. It's like Excellent. It. Yeah. And lastly, I um, racked my brain trying to figure out what um, item I would choose as my favorite. And um, I'm sometimes a bit contrarian. I think it's fair to say. So I was going to pick something um, obscure or unexpected or um, arcane. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there is one item in this sale that I um, have thought about more than any other. Um, since I first saw it years ago, I have just held this cover in the highest regard. And when it came down to it, I couldn't pick something um, ironically in, in place of this cover. So um, it is lot number 56. It is... Um, the intersection of maybe the two most romanticized or um, uh, idealized uh, eras of American history. It is a cover carried by Pony Express in June of 1861. But what makes it very special, it has a patriotic design, a cannon and flag with the verse, the Union must and shall be preserved uh, in support of the Union during the Civil War. And this cover is remarkable for a lot of reasons. The first is that it came from San Francisco, June of 1861. We are still very early in the war. We are between uh, the opening shots of the war being fired at Fort Sumter and the first battle of Manassas. So we're, we're in the early stages of the war. Um, this was printed by a company called Hutchings and Rosenfield, who were uh, magazine publishers, map publishers. And I love how quickly they jumped into the patriotic cover game. There were illustrated covers before the Civil War, certainly. But the Civil War uh, saw this proliferation of, um, of, of illustrated covers from both sides, most of them coming from the North, because they had a lot of the printing technology, a lot of the resources. The South was uh, much more limited in what they could produce. But I love that within uh, you know such a short time uh, of the start of the war, there's already a company in San Francisco producing patriotic envelopes. Any patriotic envelope from San Francisco is incredibly rare. Any patriotic envelope printed on a government stamped envelope, especially a 10 cent government stamped envelope paying the transcontinental rate, is extremely rare. Um, but the fact that it was carried by Pony Express, again, you you really can't have two more iconic moments in American history as the, the Civil War and the Pony Express. There are only two of this design patriotic cover um, carried by Pony Express. The other is in the collection of the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. So if you uh, have any hopes of owning one of these, this is your this is your only shot. Uh, the other one's probably never never seeing the the, uh, the auction market again uh, for good reason. Um, and and uh, you know so there's there's the history behind it. Then there's also just an aesthetic beauty to it, where you've got the the red and the blue of the design itself. You've got the red stamp. You've got the blue Pony Express running pony stamp. You've got the green envelope. You've got the green St. Joseph postmark. This left San Francisco by Pony Express arrived in St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, where it entered the mail. And that's where it was carried ultimately to its destination um, in New York City. And again, this is a cover that I just, um, I couldn't pick anything else. It is too beautiful. It is too historically important. Um, it is just this, this uh, very unlikely intersection because um, the Pony Express didn't last much longer into 1861. So there's only a couple of month overlap between the Pony Express and the Civil War. The, the war breaks out, the Pony Express ends. So uh, again, it's this it's this really rare um, confluence of, uh, of historical events that I think is um, absolutely remarkable, absolutely beautiful. It is in exceptional condition. It is a, a philatelic gem of the highest order. And I... Um, 
very much am uh, envious of of whoever its next owner will be. And I, I congratulate them um, preemptively. Graham, I see you love this cover as well. <laughs> you can bid on our website January 17th. Uh, you can register, uh, ask us for, um, for, for credit and for terms. Uh, but th this is my choice. Again, I think this is just uh, an absolutely spectacular cover. Uh, see, we've got, we've got, um, we've got, we've got a bit on the book of this already. Um, yeah, it's legally binding. Um, so that's my choice. This, this beautiful patriotic pony that is just, um, really second to none when it comes to beautiful Pony Express covers. We sold the Pony Express cover to Abraham Lincoln. I think that you could argue is uh, one of the most historically important. This is, in my opinion, I'm just going to say it. It's prettier. It's, it's, the, mo it's the most beautiful patriotic, uh, most uh, beautiful Pony Express cover in existence. So that's my choice. Again, it's fun to be able to handle things like this and pick our favorites because even though somebody else will eventually own it for real, we get to play own it. Exactly. Or, we get to yeah, be the curator of these things for a couple of months. And that's a real honor. We say goodbye. And... Yeah. <laughs> See, you've got yeah. support, Graham. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, again, there, there's 130 some odd other items in this sale um, that run the gamut from the 1840s all the way up through um, about the turn of the 20th century. So we encourage you to visit hrharmer.com. You can see the entire catalog there. You can register to bid. Um, it's, we, we also picked um, particularly expensive items, I would say. <laughs> well, um, there, there, them, yeah. there, there are items in this sale um, with start prices of $75, $100. So, you know, we're not, um, we, you know, we, we pick things that are, that are um, on the higher end, but there's, um, I think there's something for everyone. Uh, you know, when you have the, you um, uh, Erevan Haub was a connoisseur. He was um, uh, just brilliant in how he put together his collection, which um, you know tells the full story from the uh, from the more common items all the way up through the the well, unique and extraordinary. That's why it's important to us when handling this whole collection. Every item is being offered individually, whether it's the fifty thousand dollar item or the odd item that we offer at zero bid. Then uh, yeah. you can download a PDF of the catalog. Um, we can. If you go to, I'm going to type it into the chat just so you can see something. Um, all of the PDFs of our catalog are going to be available. Honey. Sorry. <laughs> on this website called Issue, but it's spelled odd. Yeah. So if on you click issue. on that link, then you should be able to, or if you copy that link into your browser, then you mm -hmm. can go and view all our catalogs there. We yeah. upload everything there so that you can um, flip through it like it's a, like a, you know, a real digital catalog. And you can, um, yeah, like Allison said, download a PDF um, for, your, for your own collection as well. And I think another thing that's cool is that um, we we picked items uh, just off of what we like and, and we care about. And some of them are expensive and some of them are not quite as expensive and not quite as rare. Um, and I think that speaks to collectors. Um, not everything you buy is the most expensive or the most rare or the most um incredible thing but it's something you love and it's something that means something to you and will add to your collection um and i think that's really special so absolutely so if anyone else has any other questions we'll hang out for a few more minutes um feel free to jump in ask us about this sale ask us about other sales uh ask us about the market in general we are uh, more than happy to um to to chat I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out to you guys. Um, when an auction like this takes place, what are some of the logistics? You know, we, like we've been, we've been uh, mentioning our website, people can bid online, but mm -hmm. I think people maybe want to, uh, you know, again, look at this picture behind us. Uh, <laughs> that is an auction in the early 1960s. I want to say um, our auction room will certainly not look anything like that uh, anymore, mm -hmm. but um, interestingly, we will have many times more bidders than that. It'll be uh, less active and more active uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we host it concurrently on two different live platforms. We host it on Stamp Auction Network and on our website. Um, so you have different options for bidding live. And we also, if you are in New York and you still have the desire to be one of these people, you're, you're welcome to just give us some notice before showing up. Um, you don't have to wear a suit anymore either. You don't. No, you, you, shoes and shirt, please. But um, <laughs> otherwise, it's casual dress. Uh, you could bid by phone. Um, you could place bids on the books ahead of time as is typical with auctions and Charles will be sitting about four feet uh, to his left calling the sale. If you decide to yeah. tune in, uh, yeah, you can just follow along and listen to me and uh, yeah, and it's a lot of fun. I think it is. It is. Um, I usually clerk for the sales. So I enter um, the bits that come in uh, and Allison uh, is a wizard of handling all of the phone bidding logistics. Um, 
and that's usually how we how we run our sales. Uh, I've got the easy job. I just call the auction. Yeah, you just talk. <laughs> They're for, doing all the real just work. Just talk for three hours straight. You know? He sits there and his eyes water from seeing the screens. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's true. Or he's just crying at how much he loves stamps. It's true. Um, so future installments of this Arivon collection will be coming in most likely June and December of this year. Those will close out sort of the big main catalog. So mm -hmm. this is part eight. Um, I've already got parts one through seven on my shelf. They look beautiful together. Then you add in all the catalogs nice. that are being produced in uh, Germany and Switzerland as well. And it's um, it's very impressive to look at on a, on a bookshelf. Um, so we uh, you know, have our, our work it out for us this year. We're going to, as soon as this sale ends, we're going to dive into the next sale and, um, you know, dig, dig through these covers to find new stories to tell. It's not going to be the Hockenham Fox or the Hillsboro three cent provisional next time. It'll be something completely different that catches our eye. Um, and that's, that's, I think, you know, maybe my favorite thing of working for an auction house is uh, you get to handle material. As Allison said, you get to play owner for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then just when you start to get uh, sick and tired of it, um, <laughs> or, I'm, overly I'm, attached or overly so attached to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, but as soon as you've, you've had your, your fill of it, um, it's great because you get to sell it and then it's on to the next thing. I um, am currently working on a collection of Chicago postal history for sale in a couple of months. Um, and as soon as my eyes want to fall out of my head from looking at Chicago postmarks, it'll be um, on the transatlantic mail or whatever is next in the pipeline after that. And I think that's um, it's a lot of fun. It certainly never gets boring around here. I think you guys would agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So excellent. Um, if there's any other questions, we'll give you one or two more minutes and then we will. Uh, we'll, wrap we'll, we'll wrap it up. We'll part ways. Um, we, we love doing this. You know, we love this idea of a live stream. Uh, we'd love to, you know, do it more frequently before sales. So if that's something you guys are interested in, let us know. Um, you can always reach out to us at info at hrarmor.com. We also have a contact form on our website, but, um, let us know what, what you want to see from us before a sale, whether it's, uh, more videos, more social media posts, more live streams like this. Um, we really, you know, again, we, we think it's our, um, responsibility to help bring stamp collecting into the 21st century. And there's been a lot of great forward progress in that regard, um, uh, both, you know, with the pandemic forcing uh, societies and whatnot to get online, as well as you know, incredible content creators like Graham, obviously. Um, I think we're, we're making great strides. I think this hobby uh, certainly has a lot of life left in it. And we're, you know, uh, really proud and, and honored to be able to do our part so we're having fun we're having a, that's what i always say <laughs> yeah uh, absolutely the hobby keeps evolving exactly. keeps changing exactly and mm -hmm. we want to um we want to make sure that we stay um you know ahead of the curve on that and do whatever we can to um uh you know entice new people so thank you yeah uh everyone for joining us we've really uh we've, um we've really enjoyed this we're going to archive this so it'll be made available um auction catalogs provide a great document of what is available on the market really appreciate you guys making them available online we yeah. we um even though print catalogs uh you know are not um as uh you know th they're not the only way of, of disseminating information anymore we feel very strongly about putting stuff online creating pdfs page flips mm -hmm. um even if you can do it in reader view on issue i think is fantastic so we want to keep making these available i agree one you know an auction catalog serves its purpose of selling material for a couple of weeks or a couple of months leading up to the sale and then at that point it just becomes a really good book i think and that's what you, we want to do. You do take some on the plane to read on a plane. Some of the time. I do. I, I keep an auction catalog in my back, but right now it's on uh, Mexican provisional stamps. It's mm -hmm. a, a Christie's sale from the early nineties. Um, yeah. So again, these, we want our catalogs to have a long lifespan and that's why we're so proud uh, to put so much hard work into them. Um, love the content. Keep up great work. Thank you, Scott. Thank Same you. to you Same. and all that you do um, yep. at the APS. So mm -hmm. um, thank you again, everyone for joining us. We've had a really good time. We will see you all soon. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of your night. Graham, thank, thank you, you very guys. much. <laughs> we'll see you all soon.